sorry. That was for me, too. Anyway, Kevin Hart is the, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm just going to say this and say what I'm saying. I'm looking at the way it looks like. But uh, what, what does it matter to you what he did? And, and you know, and, and if you heard that his God is sovereign, God is sovereign. It, if you're a little fuzzy about what that means, it just means that God does what he wants to do. You don't push it around, you don't. You don't send in your amount of money to somebody to buy the words of God over. You trust him. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. It also says in another place that he would rather have he would rather have obedience than sacrifice. Obedience, obedience. God loves that kind of stuff. God is hooked on that faith thing. And so I'm looking out at folks that are faithful. We've seen you for a long time and uh, feel like you're a part of our family. And so in, anyway, we're just glad you're here. And, and we're going to sing a little bit, even in the absence of, uh, of the worship team and this, this nice uh, uh, across the front here. We're just glad. But Linda's going to come on up. She's gonna, we're going to just lead everybody. And for, we're going to sing for a little bit. The deep truths of God. And, and then I'm going to speak for a little bit. Uh, again, the deep truths of God. And it's okay if you don't understand all of it. You know, it's okay. We're just glad you're here. And, and rejoice and hope this will be the start of a wonderful, wonderful day for you. So we're going to fire this up. We're going to fire this up. And uh, you all... got something that uh, maybe the Lord has blessed you with this week, or go ahead. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. I praise God that uh, Mike and Scott and Carol and Dave are on their way back from Ohio, so just keep praying travel mercies for them. Um, they should be here sometime tomorrow afternoon. And um, we have accepted an offer on the house, and um, the inspection was Saturday, and we're just believing that everything was, was good. Um, so if everybody would pray to that effect, we would really appreciate it. And also... It's Sharon's birthday, and I won't say how old she is, but she's older than I am. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. I uh, have a praise. I, I have about a 1,000 praises, so nobody has enough time to hear them all. 
But this morning, I praise the Lord for these beautiful great-grandchildren. This is only part of them. I don't know what I've got, 25 now. So, but this is part of the grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and they love the Lord already, especially, especially I have to say Bella. Bella, I praise the Lord because she's understanding the salvation message. Most little kids six years old cannot recite the salvation message, and I hope she doesn't get beat up on the bus for it, but Anyways, um, it's, it's just wonderful, I think, Sunday morning, I don't feel like getting moving, and I have a wonderful daughter who takes charge and makes sure that we get all these kids dressed, and uh, I'm kind of slow about it, but we're here with our newest, no, this is not our newest, I forgot, we have a little boy in Syracuse, but um, our newest little great-grandchild, to come, oh yeah, we got another new one, I forgot, to come and um, get a piece of the action, I guess I would have to say. So praise God that he loves us and we live in a free country where we can bring our children to church and our great-grandchildren, great amen. I just praise, praise the Lord that uh, my son and his wife got a house in Kentucky. They have been staying in it, but they haven't got all their stuff moved in yet. It's going to take them a while because he's still not in good health because of uh, surgery he had a little while back. And I just pray that the Lord does things in my life that I can get down there with him. These two children are no more COVID positive. And Virginia didn't catch it. That is the biggest praise of all. Are you ready? Amen. <laughs> Do you want me to turn this one off?
What's that? Yeah, I see it. It's right here. I'm biding my time. Anyway, ah, let's see. Uh, I think, where you, anybody else have a birthday? Anybody else? All right. Anybody's birthday now, today, this week, next week, this next? Anybody? Just sharing, right? Now, let's, let's do it one more time, only so I stay and sing. Happy birthday. Come on, sing it up. God bless you. All right. Well, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Anyway. All right. Now, let's see. Again, I'm still a little foggy on, on so... Uh, at this time, well, I'm going to pray, and that if you have an offering, if you want to bring it up, is that what you normally do? Would pastor announce it like that? Okay. Let, Father, thank you for your generosity to us, and now uh, we're going to express our thanks and our gratitude to you and our generosity back. We give you great praise. Thank you for supporting us and keeping us going. In Jesus' precious name, and everybody said... Amen. Amen. Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay. Can you all hear me or should it be louder? How's that? Is that better? That's a nice song. Do you know this song? He will carry you. Do you know that? I love that song. I'm just going to do this since she's right here. He said, come on to me. Amen.
Great, great message. Anyway, um, a couple of weeks ago, I started doing a series on the, the, the miracles of Jesus as recorded in the book of John. This week, I'm going to break for that from that for one week, only so that you know, we get, we get our crowd here, all of our crowd, because I think it's very important. I really do. I do. What's that? Got a lot of people playing rugby with us. Well, so uh, anyway, I have another, I have another message that I, I kind of developed this week in, in lieu of that. And uh, I'm going to read from the book of Joshua, the book of Joshua. So if, if you have your Bible with you or your iPad or tablet or something, you know, it's good. It's good to have the Word of God. It, it really is. Uh, but I'm going to read it for you, Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 15. And here goes. I'm going to be reading from the NIV, the NIV. Here it is. Now, the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord with my whole heart. And so on, on the day that Moses swore to me, and I quote, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the wilderness, so here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong. I like that, that positiveness. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go into battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as, in his, as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. I know you do. I know. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for your precious word. I pray, Lord, that you'll give us a, a sense of understanding and open our eyes so that we may see in our ears so that we can hear. Sometimes the word can be just a little, a little old-fashioned in the way that it's been communicated or a little bit more cryptic, but... Um, Help me to explain it in such a way so that everybody gets, gets a, a pretty good grasp of it. And I'm going to thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. You know, we live in a world today that's filled with anxiety, don't we? I, I think I quoted to you um, last week that the greatest, um, the, the, the greatest, situation, medical situation facing our people today between the ages of 50, 15 and 55 is depression. It's depression. And, and so we have issues today. People have been home, kids have been home for a couple of years, 
and not interacting with other folks and, and just people are worried. Our, our kids are hearing stuff today that, you know, when, when I was, I'm a baby boomer and most, most of us here are baby boomers, if, if not all, that, you know, even probably in this building right here, uh, down through classrooms, you know, we were always told that there could be a, a nuclear attack. And if there was, get under your desk like that was going to help you, right? It, it just wasn't going to. But we kind of grew up with that fear. And, and fortunately, most people in that age group have kind of sloughed that off, you know. And we've seen a lot in the past few decades. We've seen a lot of stuff. But there are folks on the scene today that are very young. They, they don't have that experience, right? They don't know that things kind of come and go and there's always saber rattling in our, in our politics and our nations. We, you know, and so they grow up hearing today like by the, if somebody says this, um, there's a politician today right here in New York State, downstate. I, I won't say the name because we do want to retain our tax exempt status. Right here in our state that says, by the year 2030, the earth is going to be di is dying. Have you heard that? What, what a crock. What, what a crock. I mean, there, there are other things that we could cite from science that completely dispels that. But there's, again, this fear-mongering. People are so anxious today. And it's not just, you know, we have a granddaughter. She just graduated this year. She's at Fredonia college and uh i mean it could have been worse she she was accepted at colgate she could have gone there which would have been a whole lot worse good school it has been but they're they're they've just the wheels have come off you know they've gone around the bend and and so she could have gone there but she is just so intent and in thinking that if we don't have electric cars in the next three or four years, you know, we're all going to die by 30. You know, I'm serious. It's just she's very, very smart, very smart. But she's bought into a narrative, a lot of anxiety. Back in this time that we're reading about, there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety. Now, Dwight Eisenhower, anybody remember what president, was he 34th president? You probably all remember Dwight Ike, right? I think he was the 34th president, maybe. But he, he was somebody, he was a general, right? General of the forces overseeing D-Day and all that. Very, very difficult time. But men and women of strength. And, and Dwight said, every tomorrow has two handles. It has the handle of faith and it has the handle of anxiety, right? Today, we're looking at the story of Caleb here. Who He was an old man, and he took a hold of tomorrow with the handle of faith. Hallelujah. The handle of faith. Now, here is the, 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 what we're reading about here. Uh, it's years before, years before this all took place. The Israelites had been released from Egypt. Very bad situation, very, very bad situation. And, and so uh, they, and then they're in the desert. God is leading them by way of Moses. He's leading them across uh, the desert. Now, they've arrived at the borders of Canaan, and he's taken them out of slavery. He's led them across the Red Sea. I love that story of the Red Sea, don't you? I've heard people say, well, at certain times of the year, The Red Sea goes down to about three inches of water. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what a miracle. That means the whole Egyptian army drowned in three inches of water. You know, God has led, God has led them across uh, the, de the desert. He's, he's taken them through the Red Sea where it parts. 
They've just been to the mountain of God. They've received the Ten Commandments. And now just a few days later, they're, they're at the edge of this place they called the promised land because God promised it to them. And, and so it, it was a land, Canaan, they, it was called. And now they just weren't taking land from legitimate owners. These are people that God had been dealing with. And again and again, for a couple of, God is patient. He really is. A couple of centuries, and he keeps saying to them, stop being idolatrous. Stop worshiping golden calves. Stop doing that. They can't do anything for you. They're nothing. That's right. they're, they're, they don't worship God. And God keeps saying, don't do that. Don't do that. And so now God is saying, time is up. You know, could that happen to America? Yeah. Could it? You know, nowhere in the Bible is America mentioned. Some people will preach that it is, but I don't believe it is mentioned. I don't believe. So America is not the center of the universe. It's not. We're a reasonably new nation, more than a couple of hundred years old. Nations, countries have been around for a lot longer who are no longer here today. We're not the center of the universe. We're just not. And so now Canaan is, is going to be, there's curses there. God is taking that land from the inhabitants because they've been idolatrous. They, they've been idol worshipers. Now God is going to bless the Israelites with that same land, a land that God told them would be flowing with milk and honey. Now it sounds real sticky. <laughs> but it's not actually milk and honey. It's just saying everything they'd ever want. They were going to live in houses they didn't build. They were going to drink from wells they, they didn't dig. They were going to eat grapes from vineyards they didn't plant, right? And so Moses sends out these 12 spies. Remember that story? 12 spies. They go into the land. They're scouting it out in preparation for this. And, but they come back, and 10 of the spies are not happy with what they've seen. In fact, the Bible says that they come back with a bad report. Now, here, a little something. Whenever you read in the Old Testament that there is a bad report, it's usually not the truth. You, like, remember when Joseph, remember, he was thrown in a pit by his brothers who were jealous of him? And the Bible says that they came back to the father with a bad report. It wasn't just, ooh, this is bad. What, a, what bad information here. The, my son is... You know, it's not like something bad is happening. It means they lied. Whenever you read that, it's a, bad, it's, a, it's a lie. So these guys come back with this bad report. They're saying, we can't conquer these people. They're bigger. They're stronger than us. They're, their walls are, are really high. In fact, they're so big there, we look like grasshoppers. Not just to them, but we felt like we were grasshoppers. You know, there's, a, there's an old adage that says that some people look at life like a glass half full or half empty of water, right? These guys looked at it like it was half empty, right? They talked about the mighty people they couldn't conquer, the fortresses they couldn't bring down. They felt like grasshoppers. And when they were telling this account to the people listening, leaders, and just people, the Bible says that they became afraid. A place that God said, I'm giving to you. I'm going to hand it to you. But they became afraid. In fact, they were so afraid. The Bible teaches us that, listen to this, this is crazy. They even thought of going back to Egypt. Are you serious? I mean, in Egypt, they, they were slaves. They, 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 they just, I, I like garlic. I like onions. But the Bible says that their main staples were leeks and garlic. I mean, can you imagine going up to somebody and going, hi. <laughs> One time, now, I, I had gone somewhere myself, and a, a guy that sings with us sometimes, Mark Gibson, kind of a big guy. I don't know if he's 
He's, he's been here with us, but uh, he and I went to the state fairgrounds and they had these, these, uh, these salsa maker things, right? And they, well, I bought one. I normally don't buy stuff, but I bought one of these. He said, this makes great salsa. He bought one, maybe two. So I bought one and I brought it home and, and I'm not a cook. I'm not a chef. I'm, I'm not even a sous chef. And, <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm saying, I'm going to make some salsa for us. And so I'm in the, our kitchen, and I'm just, I'm reading the instructions. Okay, and it tells me how many things of garlic. And so I didn't, you know, you can split garlic up, I guess, into these little bulbs, whatever. I didn't do that. I, I put like three garlics in it. I'm serious. Not, not, the, not, not the little pea, but the, the garlic. And I'm there. I'm doing pretty good. So anyway, I made this stuff, and I, I, I kind of liked it, right? The next, that was Saturday. The next morning, we had to leave to go over by Cannon Dagwood to sing. And we're in, our, we're in our car, and I couldn't smell it, but Linda said, it's just oozing out of your pores. And so, we, you know, we always put a product table up, I, I, I didn't go, I sang, we're at a distance, and there are all these people here. And so afterwards, Linda said, don't go near the, the, the CD table. Don't go over there. So I didn't. I, I stayed up, you know, doing the equipment while she was at the table. And people would come up and go. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but these people are talking about going back. And here's another little thing, a little tidbit of information. In Egypt, these Israelis had no rights. They, they had no rights, you know. Um, when we, we go to Newfoundland, up there, it's an island off Labrador, and we sing up there. But we have to remember, it's, it used to be part of England, it's now part of Canada. And that when we go there, you know, you see the speed limit sign, 100, right? Kilometers, right? Took me a week before I realized that. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so, but you don't want to get, as a citizen here, you don't want to get pulled over by the police because you have no rights. You're not a citizen. Israelis had no rights. An Egyptian soldier especially could come into your house, and if you had daughters, he could take one of your daughters. He could take your wife. He, he, he could do he can come in your house, he can do whatever he wants to do. And these people were thinking of going back to e Are you serious? That's they were they were so so afraid of this, right? They didn't want to go into Canaan. But that wasn't true of two of these guys, Caleb and Joshua. They saw they didn't see the glass half empty. They saw beauty Riches, they saw milk and honey by the gallon, right? But above all, they saw God. They saw, they heard his promises. So Caleb stands up in front of all the assembly, it says, the, all the people there. And he, here's what he says. I'm going to quote this to him from Numbers. The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only don't, be, don't rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land because we're going to swallow them up. That's what, that's what he said. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. In essence, Caleb is saying to this, yeah, those guys are strong, but our God is stronger. They're big, but our God is huge. Yeah. We're going to chew them up. We're going to spit them out because they can't beat God. Folks, and, and he says, re remember, our God convinced Pharaoh to let us go. Our God has taken care of us going across the desert by night and by day. He's provided food and water for, for us. 
We get to the Red Sea. You, you saw it with your own eyes. You saw it part. Then you saw it coming back together when the army was there. You, you saw, we went to, to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God where God gave us his law. You know, Egypt, he says, doesn't stand a chance against our God, and neither do these guys. People didn't listen to him. They became afraid. They rebelled. They rejected the promise of God. And because of their rejection, God turned them away. He turned, could God turn us away? Right? We've had a pretty, you know, America's not perfect, but somebody has said it sure beats whatever's in second place. Could God replace America with something else? Yeah. Because of their fear, God turned them away. And they were forced to wander, wander in the desert for 40 long, long years. Here, let me read this to you from, from uh, Numbers. In this desert, your bodies will fall, every one of you, 20 years old or more who was counted in the census who grumbled against me not one of you will enter the land I swore with an uplifted hand to make your home except Caleb son of Jephunneh and Joshua son of Nun there's others that say the same thing and it one says except for Je Caleb Caleb now has a dream remember who said that Martin Luther King, he said, I have a dream, right? The Bible says that without a dream, people what? They perish. Somebody else has said that if your dream dies, listen to this, this is important. If your dream dies, dream another dream. If that dream dies, dream another dream. Now, some of you, perhaps, I don't know. I've said this here before, I think. You know, when you were young, remember that? Remember way back then? You know? You were a young woman, and you, you thought, I'm marrying my Prince Charming. But after a while, you realized you, you married the frog. Or a man, you know, you, you thought you were marrying your honey, but you ended up marrying honey boo-boo, right? Long years, right? Caleb had a dream. He had a dream. He knew he had a special inheritance with his name on it, a piece of land in Canaan. So for 45 long years, he replaced this promise over and over again. So when they get to this land, he knows because he's seen it. He knows where his property is. And he wants it. Now, there are a couple of problems. A couple of problems, okay? This, uh, there's always a couple of problems. The first one is, Somebody already lives there, and they like it too. And these guys were giants. And they just, they have a few there. The place was infested with them. They were all over the place. Terminex couldn't do this. It was infested with, and they didn't have any idea of sharing with them, right? That was the first problem. The second problem is Caleb is 85 years old. 85 years. I know guys that are my, I'm 72 now. This is the oldest I've ever. What? Okay. <laughs> this is the oldest I've ever been. Be gentle with me. 85, I, I was talking with a guy, I was mowing my lawn yesterday. And a guy came by and says, man, he said, you really go around that pretty good, you know. And uh, he, he didn't ask me how old, but he said, for a guy your age, I hate that. You know, don't you hate it when you go to the doctor and they, they look at something, they say, well, you know, for your age, it's appropriate. I don't want to hear that. 
I, I want to hear, you know, for a guy that's 40 years old, you're in pretty good shape. I don't. He's 85 years old. That's pretty old to be taken on giants. You know, in our society, we've convinced ourselves that ourselves that once we age, we're, we're worthless. You know, uh, you know, we're, we're we're more useless. You know, we make jokes about getting old. You know, you're getting old when you sit in a rocking chair and you can't get it going. Right? The the gleam in your eyes from the sun hitting your bifocals. Right? You sink your teeth into a steak and they stay there. You know. So, so, you know, we just have this, we just have this suspicion that when we get old, we lose value. One, one man told his, uh, his son, they were talking, and the son said, how old are you, Dad? And the father said, well, I'm 39 and holding. The young man said, well, how old would you be if you let go? <laughs> right? There comes this mindset that we let go, Right? Caleb didn't think that way. He, he just refused to let old age keep him down, right? Winston Churchill, you've, you've all heard of him, right? He was 65 when he was prime minister of England during the war, right? 65. Thomas Edison was still inventing in his laboratory when he was 84, right? 81, Ben Franklin was quarreling with delegates, at the Constitutional Convention, right? 80, 81 years old. 75, a guy by the name of Ed Delano bicycled 3,100 miles across the United States in 33 days, right? 96-year-old resident, George Selbach, scored a 110-yard hole-in-one at Indian River Golf Course in Michigan, right? It's, you know, just people say, you know, who is the, I can't think of who it was right now, but um, they said, how old would you be? Satchel Page. Yeah. He said, they, they asked, he said to them, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you was? Right? If you didn't know how old you were, how old would you be? Ty Cobb. Another baseball player used to say, uh, old age may slow me down, but it doesn't stop me. Amen. It, it just doesn't stop. And Caleb is telling his friend Joshua, I'm 85 years old. And I know there are giants, but I can whip them. That's it. I can whip. I don't care how old I am. And, and you know what? Caleb was depending on God to help him face his giants. We need to learn to think that way. Folks, we need to learn to think that way. And don't let, we all have failures. We all have a, this, this litany of things that we can look to and say, well, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. Abraham Lincoln could do that too. I didn't do that, didn't make that, lost that election, didn't get that race, didn't, and he ends up president. He's on, he's on the coins. Here's this big failure who was a two-term president of the United States, right? Just, there was this pre, uh, professor. You've probably heard this one before. He wrote up on this, this, this blackboard these letters, and he put them right together, and he wrote G-O-D-I-S-N-O-W-W-H-E-R-E. -E. And he asked the class, hey, what does that spell out? And 98% of the class, God is nowhere. That's what it's about. God is nowhere. Then a couple of students said, no, it doesn't say that. God is now here, right? It all depends on, on, on how you look at it. It depends on what you're looking for as to what you see, you know, when you're in the middle of a conflict, how many are going through a conflict today? Anybody? Most, most of us are, right? You know, if you've got, I'm, I'm sorry, if you've got children of a certain age, yeah. 
You know, somebody has said, our kids grow up, but they don't go away. I, I'm glad for that. I love our, I love our kids. I really do. But, but the thing is this, you know, there is conflict in our lives. Jesus said in this world, you're going to have trouble, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be there. When you're in the middle of con a health issue, you know, Pastor Scott, and, and, and you know, Rob, you guys have had your share of things. You know, Scott has open heart surgery. And then a, a few months later, he has back surgery. You know, so many things. And when you're in the middle of going through something today, I mean, Gary, you're, you're trying to work out that, that property thing, you know, the sale of things going on. Dan, I don't know what's always going on. And, or, or Bob and, and Bonnie, I don't know what's going on. And Sam, I don't know what's going on. You know, Virginia, I don't know what's going on. Sharon, I don't know what's going on in your life. Caleb, you know, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I know in, in the Hardy's life, I hear a little bit more, you know, because Scott and I talk. But when we're faced with the giants of doubt and despair, then, then, that's the time we need to focus on God's presence and his power. Amen. And his, that's that, that verse, Paul says, when I am weak, then I become strong because I get out of the way and God steps in and his power becomes my power. When I am weak, then I become strong because his strength is made perfect in my weakness. David once, David once wrote these words, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The key here is delighting yourselves in the Lord. Then, it's not just this carte blanche thing. You know, you sign up for church membership. Well, I expect the blessing. No. It's, you delight yourself in God. You find your... Peter Pan found his happy thought, that was the movie, in his children. But a Christian finds their strength in delighting themselves in God. Hallelujah. That's, that's where the real... That's, that's where, the, where the real moxie is. That's where the real strength is. Is that should that should just really uh, influence the way that we pray, right? Are you praying, people? Do you pray, right? I don't. I don't mean just get up in the morning, you know, and, and just give a kind of a little bit of a thing, and at night, you know, it's the now I lay me down to sleep idea. Linda and I have been married fifty-one years now. And if I'm gone somewhere, she's either calling me or I'm calling her. I, I came out here yesterday afternoon to bring some stuff out. And she was home. I called her twice. I think she called me once. And we only live 45 minutes away, right? And that's why we don't just say hello in the morning and good night. <laughs> We just communicate through the day. That's what God wants us to do with him. He, he loves us, right? If we could be able to hear Caleb pray, you know, it probably would have gone something like this. God, I know what you've done in the past. I've watched you get us out of Egypt. I, I, I've watched as you parted the Red Sea. And, <clears throat> and I watched as you came down on Mount Sinai in your power and your strength. I've seen your faithfulness and kindness as we've wandered the desert. And I praise you for your love and for your mercy. And, and, and God, I, I know that you love me. And I know you've promised something to me. And, and because of that, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. And until that time, and until that, that thing that you've promised, I'm just going to wait here patiently. I don't care how long it takes, you know. 
sometimes we get to the place where we, we say, God, I need this or please do this. And we can't wait 45 minutes. And this guy waits 45 years. We can't wait a day or a week. We're, we're so childish in what we do, right? He wakes, I, I, tell, I love this. He waits expectantly. That's what we should be as, as Christians, right? We, we should be like, like this, like Christmas time. You know, when you go to bed at, you're a child, and you go to bed, and you can barely sleep at night, right? You're going, I think I hear something on the roof, right? <laughs> we need to be expectant, right? That means I call it an edge of your seat type faith. Not that, now I, I'll tell you what I call it. I call it the other thing, the old man faith. Yeah, I've been waiting on God now for about two years. I'm sitting back in my recliner. It's pretty good. I'm going to doze off to sleep here in a minute. But I've got my remote. You know, it's that kind of faith that just is old and tired. You get like that. I'm not knocking that down. But an expectant faith says something is going to happen. Hallelujah. I'm not exactly sure when. I, it's kind of like Abraham. Remember, God tells Abraham to leave his father's house. Abraham was how old? What? He was like, like 80s or 90s or something. And, and God tells him, get up and go. And it's like, it's like Abraham saying, where am I going? And God says, I'll let you know. Well, how long will I be gone? You'll find out. <laughs> He's my straight man back there. <laughs> but that's, our, our faith should be, I don't know what's going to happen. It's like, uh, just this little tidbit, my message next week is on feeding the 5,000, right? And Philip, I'll tell you this, he fails his test. When Jesus said, how are we going to feed all these people? Philip could have gone, well, Lord, you may turn water into wine. You healed this guy who was crippled all of his life. I don't know how we're going to do it, but I know you can. And I'm pretty anxious. I'm pretty stoked. I'm, I'm getting jacked up thinking about how you're going to do it. Right? That's the kind of faith, folks, we need to have. I don't care if you're 50, 60, 90. I don't care. We need to have an expectant faith. I'll, I'll let that one go from there. Now, I've told this story here before, but I'll tell it again because so, this is how I close. <clears throat> Over a century ago, uh, the telegraph was a big way to communicate, right? right. What did I say? Isn't that what I said, Caleb? You need to look through more than that crack between those screens. <laughs> I appreciate you, Caleb. I do. I do. Over a century ago, when Morse code was the fastest way of getting a message, a young man applied for a job. As a Morse code operator, he read, the, he read the ad in the paper and he went to the, the building. There was a large, busy office filled with noise, and including the sound of the telegraph. And, and a sign on the desk said, uh, uh, fill out this application and turn it in. 
and go sit over here. He did just that. And there were a number of other young men sitting there just like he was after his application. Constantly in the background, da 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 you know, whatever. And at one point, this young man gets up, walks over to the boss's office, and just walks in. And these other guys are sitting there who have been there maybe half an hour, hour or more. They go, man, is he blowing it? Well, about 15 minutes later, he comes out. The boss has got his arm around his shoulder. And the boss said to everybody else, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, but the job has been filled. And they began grumbling among themselves. And one guy said, wait a minute. I, I, I don't understand. He was the last to come in. We didn't even get a chance to interview, but he got the job. The employer said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but the last several minutes while you guys were sitting here, the telegraph has been ticking out the following message. If you understand this message, come right in. The job is yours. None of you understood it. He did. The job is his. That's the kind of expectancy God wants from those who sign up as followers of Jesus. We don't, we don't all have to come out and be monks or priests or, or gospel singers or evangelists. or men. We don't all. No. We don't have to do that. All of us have. We all have a place. Not one place is better or stronger or anything more than the other. Amen. Like the Bible talks about that. You know, there's, there's, there's a head and there's arms and there's legs and hearts, all that. We all fit in. And we are all important. But God wants us to say, Lord, these hands are dirty. But if you want to use them, here they are. And God is really, really, really good at using dirty hands. He's really, really good at taking people who have been just so eh, so-so in life. Some would call them zeros and making heroes out of them. As you look through the word of God, Hallelujah. I came from a housing project. I am the only one in, out of seven kids that went to college. I'm one of, one of two out of the seven that finished high school. Only three of us have been married once. And I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying, recounting my history. You know, two of my siblings have been married five times. My father went to sixth grade. My mother went to eighth grade in Newfoundland. Education wasn't a big thing, being taught. They wanted us to do well. Growing up in a project, I learned how to do this more and how to use profane language more. I learned how to get what I wanted. But one day, somebody told me about Jesus Christ. And I accepted him as my forgiver as my savior. When that happened, God put into motion things. Now, are you too old for that? <laughs> no. God has a timing for all of us. And your timing may have started 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Maybe it starts today. I don't know. But anyway, I got nothing else. I'm done. I've already gone too long. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. <laughs> Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the opportunity 
to say that <clears throat> I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm going to heaven in spite of my past. Lord, I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit that indwells me, that, that guides me and teaches me and comforts me, that performs healing in my mind and in my spirit, sometimes in my body. Lord, I'm thankful for times in our lives, in our marriage, when you did something wonderful because of these things. We have children today. Lord, I give you great praise. And, and Lord, I pray that you'll, you'll, you'll encourage us by this, these, these words about this, this guy, Caleb, who really trusted you and stepped out on a limb and you didn't let him down. Father, I pray that you'll bless every person here. People that are here right now, they're faithful to you. They trust you. They love you. We ask, Lord, that you would just in a mighty way empower each and every one of us so that we might be a blessing to those around us and to you. Father, we ask that you go with us as we leave this building. And thank you for Caleb back there operating the sound and, and, and for different folks as they, folks as they clean the church, as, as they open doors, as they, they, they get things going and prepare this place for worship. Father, we just, we need you. We're a needy, we're a needy people. We really, truly are. Thanks for uh, Diana back there with the kids and, and Lord, just so many things. We just, we just look forward to your blessings, continued blessings. Uh, thanks for the Hardys who have worked here for all these years. Bless their lives, I pray. And Lord, we're just, we're just gonna try with your help to build on what they've already put here by your help. And we're just gonna do that by your strength and by your, by your power. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name that strengthens us and helps us to enjoy this day. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen.